American University in Bulgaria. So, uh, welcome once again. Uh, this second part of today's lecture uh, will be basically about me giving you uh, some extra information about what is traded on the market. Um, given what is traded, what data we can extract from the market information and how then we can use it in our uh, risk modeling. So, I, I, I don't have the goal to give you every bit of information about this. It's, it's quite a large uh, subject and the whole course probably can be made about what financial data is and how we can model financial instruments and that's that's not really the goal here uh, rather I'll, I'll try to give you information about the instruments from which we usually extract data that we model uh, in a sense in the system and to start uh, the simplest and the most well-known financial instrument there is on the market, this is the stock. So, uh, the stock is a security that signifies ownership in a given company. So when you buy a stock, you're actually buying ownership in a, in a company. Uh, when, when one firm decides it wants to expand, they usually say, okay, we, we have 100 stocks, we as owners, we're, we're going to keep uh, 80 of them, the, the other 20 we're gonna sell to someone who wants to buy them and wants to give us money for that and this this money will go into the company and we can grow our, our own business. Now, this buying and selling of uh, stocks, of ownership, usually happens in, in, on exchanges. You've heard of London Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, Nasdaq is an all electronic exchange. Uh, there are certain requirements for a given company to become exchange traded. It's not that easy to be an exchange trader. Every company can have stocks and sell them, but in order to uh, this trading to uh, to happen on a on a market, there are certain things that needs to happen. It, it needs to be very open about about its books, uh, very transparent in a sense of. What, uh, what the company owns, uh, what it expects to make in the next quarter, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the, the good thing about the stock or equity, which is um, another synonym for that, is that the, the exchanges, they're, they're becoming so, so good at trading that uh, they can supply quotes or prices for trades uh, on a millisecond basis so you're looking at quite a large data pool so every millisecond you have uh, buy orders sell orders if a given uh, trade happens it will be somewhere on those if you want to buy a stock you see the uh, the possible counterparties that want to sell that stock and given prices and you usually pick the lowest one and if you want to sell a stock you see the other counterparties that want to buy this stock and you pick the highest price so you're actually looking at a whole range of prices and where the, the actual trade happens that's uh, that's the trade price and in, co in the cognitive system, we don't really deal uh, with intraday trading. We usually look at the closing price of a given stock. So that's the final price for any given date. And when you have this information, the closing price, you can actually look how the price changed from day to day. And this is what we're going to be seeing a little bit later on. Uh, the price that is quoted by the exchange is usually for one share. It doesn't mean that you actually have to go and buy only one share, you can buy a hundred, but that's something a little bit different. Now, um, in terms of what we model and, and the data that comes out of this, uh, we're uh, really interested in the, in the log return uh, for a given date. So, uh, this is basically the, the, 
well, the difference in logarith logarithm prices or the logarithm of uh, the ratio between today and yesterday's price. So this would be the, uh, the log return of the stock. Now, uh, the reason for using log return uh, as opposed to on just looking at the ratio of ST over ST minus one, uh, if you subtract minus one here, you actually uh, get what is called the percentage return of a, a given investment. So, um, if you have this as R, RP, let's put it. So, uh, you have today's price as zero, and if you do this, you get S1. So, this would be the percentage return. Uh, where uh, for stocks it's customary to look at the logarithm which is this thing here basically because this value here uh, has a hard floor so you cannot go below the price cannot be zero so this quantity here cannot fall below minus one when st is equal to zero so the, that's the minimum that this value can obtain <laughs> And uh, this is the most basic model and historically the first one that was proposed for modeling financial instruments and stocks in particular was the Gaussian distribution, which takes values between minus infinity and plus infinity. It's not really, it's not really interesting to model a, uh, sorry, uh, something that cannot, go below minus one with a distribution that goes to minus infinity. Now the Gaussian model is uh, it's not really a good one for this, but we'll see later on more advanced model, but still we're gonna be based around the stock price and the log return for the stocks. Now uh, another, another financial instrument, so to speak, uh, that is quite common is Fund. Now, under fund, this is a very general term and um, it encompasses a lot of uh, different entities. Uh, the, in the very general sense, a fund is a, a portfolio uh, that allows other people to invest in it. So, I'm a manager of a, of a given portfolio and uh, I allow other people to invest in me and through me to invest in uh, my skills as a manager and the assets I want to invest in. So it's, again, it's kind of ownership, but ownership in, not in a company or anything else, but in, in my skills and my stock selection, if you would like. Uh, of course, I'm paid for this, so I retain some of the fees from the, uh, from the performance I get. So if I return 10%, uh, over the last year, I will keep one or two percent of that for myself. Now, uh, the funds are, uh, are geared towards either wealthy individuals or banks or pension funds that want to invest in that. And uh, it, it's relatively less risky to invest in funds than to invest in stocks. There's someone else who is managing the money and doing day-to-day day, day training in order to ensure that there is less risk. Uh, but one of the major difficulties in investing in funds is the fact that you, you cannot really go out and take your money away from a fund very easily. Some funds have up to a six-month redemption period. So you, today you, you need to say, okay, in six months I want my money back. and so on and so forth. So it will take some time. It's not like a stock where you can actually go out and sell it straight away. Uh, and also, also a, a difficulty is that uh, fund managers don't always uh, report their returns daily. So they, they, they have their own returns. So if you invest $100, you're gonna get some return on your investment, but they would report these returns on a monthly basis they're not dealing with daily, they don't want actually to deal with daily because that's accounting problem for them. So they will report that monthly, which means that when you look uh, 
into a fund uh, and you don't have transparency into what positions they, are, they have taken, you can only look at it as a return stream and this return stream seems monthly. So we, we kind of get from, uh, from one end of the spe spectrum where stocks are traded and millisecond trades, we get to funds where they report on a monthly basis and you see this gap between the, the data that is available millisecond for one, monthly for the other, which is a huge gap. Now, uh, no, th this is not uh, always the case. There are some funds that actually uh, are exchange, exchange traded. So uh, they are structured as a public company and they go out and they can be traded on the exchange. And you get daily or intraday, intraday for, the, for the funds just as a stock would. And lastly, the performance is usually reported in, in this way rather than log return. But uh, again, when we want to model the return of these, we, we use the log return and not the percentage one. Yeah, so basically this is the sl this slide as well. So whatever we we can apply to stocks we can usually apply to a fund up to a point and of course now uh, for stocks you can actually build a very sophisticated model with a lot of bells and whistles in there but in order to to fit the model you actually need data and when you have monthly returns that's not so much because uh let's say five years worth of data for a fund is only 60 observations so compare that to a stock that has 250 observations each year. So 1,250 1, observations for the same period. So quite a large difference in data availability. Now, uh, moving on with another financial instrument. That, now this one is a little bit more interesting. Uh, Bond. So, this, this security is exchange rate usually, and it represents basically an ob obligation by the issuer that he's going to repay what is written on the bond in a given time frame or on a specific date. Uh, this is usually uh, the, the amount of money is usually called nominal, and or paramount or face value, and at the end of the life of the bond when it ends uh, this needs to be repaid uh, I, I mentioned that stocks are a way for a company to raise capital uh, issuing a bond is another way uh, but this is a separate thing because you're not selling out the company you're actually just taking a loan in a sense but from the financial markets and not an institution as a bank a loan would be a bank uh, a bank uh, instrument but a bond is traded on the market and you can actually go out and find better uh, better yields or better interest rates to use for that now uh, usually uh, a bond also pays coupons on a on a fixed schedule so every six months this bond would pay out 6% of the nominal. So every every six months, you're, uh, you're gonna see $3, given out $3, and it's $3 and not six, basically because the 6% is per annum. So this is 6% for the whole year, and when you're giving out every six months, you divide by two. So a bond with face value of $100 and a 6% coupon per annum, giving coupons semi-annually, would give you on 1st of January and 1st of June and then next year 1st of January, 1st of June, $3. At, at the end of its life, on the maturity date, it would give you $3 and $100, which would be the nominal. Maybe it would be nice to actually have it like this. So on this date, you're going to receive the nominal plus the coupon. You have coupon here, coupon here. Up on here, up on here, and usually this period is one and the same, even though I haven't really written it out or drawn it. And 
when we are here today, you basically you're looking at future cash flows of on these dates as well. We can have multiple here. Now, uh, how 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 to quote uh, a bond? What what is actually the market price of a bond? Uh, it, it's based on the power amount of a hundred. Even even if the power amount is not a hundred, it could be something else. But usually the quote is uh, written out as uh, for a par of a hundred, and it would be the price that uh, uh, you need to pay in order to get the bond. But there are uh, some difficulties here. So. Uh, let's say the price is 96 for a bond paying 100. So this would mean that you will actually uh, go out and pay 96 dollars. Unfortunately, no. There is uh, what you are gonna pay is the dirty price of the bond, and what is quoted this 96 is actually the clean price of the bond. The the distinction and the reasoning behind the clean and dirty price has to do with the time value of money, so to speak. I think I have, yeah, something like this here. Now, uh, if this is today here and you're looking at future cash flows like this, these cash flow do not have uh, the same value for you today. Basically, uh, this comes from the fact that owning a hundred dollars today is different from owning a hundred dollars one year from now. You're a little bit uncertain about those hundred dollars one year from now. Also, if you have it today, you can actually invest that and get a return on your money. And a hundred dollars today would probably mean that one year from now you have a hundred and five dollars. So you need to see $105 in one year from now in order for you to be roughly the same as having $100 today. So this is called time value of money. And it basically says that uh, any cash flows in a future date, one period from now, needs to be discounted with a certain interest rate. This, these are the 5% I mentioned in my example. And this would actually be your present value today Oops. from any given cash flow and if this cash flow is two years from now it would be two years something like this so since we have cash flows here every period six months or one year, each of these cash flows uh, has different time value today, a different price value, uh, present value today. And we calculate the value of each of these cash flows as of this date, and we sum them up and we get the price of the bond. So this would be here. The same thing, I mean, the coupons and the nominal at the end. This end should be here, not here. Anyway, uh, the difference in between clean and dirty price is the following. If we zoom in here, we have a cash flow or coupon payment here. We are here today, this is today. And we already have a cash flow here. Now, uh, if I and assume even, even even if we didn't have a cash flow here, and this is actually the start of the bond, the previous owner hold the bond between here and here, and he actually deserves a part of the whole coupon payment from here to here, just because he owned it from uh, in this time period. So he would like to actually keep some of this coupon because. This formula here actually assumes that the prices for owning every cash flow from the start of the cash flow 
including this coupon here, which is the very next one from today. But the previous owner wants to keep this portion here. So he would quote a clean, a clean price, but would like actually to, uh, for you to pay the dirty price, which would be the clean price plus this here, this kind of thing here. Uh, I think this went a little bit too far than I had imagined. But anyway, uh, that's clean and dirty price for you. The major thing to get out of this is, uh, is this right here that is used to discount future cash flows. Uh, this is the return on investment you would like to see from these cash flows. Basically, this is this is the return that you are willing, the future return that you are willing to give up uh, in order to have something today rather than have it in next year or the year after that or the periods after that. So, this this is the yield of the bond. Actually, I think, yeah, uh, I have a slide on this as well. So any given bond has this yield, and in order to price the bond, to find its market price or theoretical price, you plug in a given yield. Uh, there is a, another way to actually look at this information, and it's from the other way around. You observe the market prices of the bonds. So this, these are the prices that market participants are willing to pay for the given bond. And you ask yourself, okay, what is the rate that these people would like to see? You basically need to solve the equation with R unknown and PV known. PV you take from the market, you know the coupons, you know the periods, you know the nominal, you don't know R. So when you, when you calculate that, you uh, extract the yield from the bond. And market data providers usually do this for you and they built what is called yield curves. And a yield curve, it's basically something like this. Three months, six months, 12 months, two years, so on, up to 30 years. And a curve, something like this. And here is the right uh, per annum for investments in these time periods. So this is the rate you want to see for this period of time. And in a sense, uh, we are moving from bond prices, which are basically what uh, you need to pay to, to uh, the interest rate that governs the bond price. And we will see in a bit why this is important. here uh, maybe I'm too quick with this or I didn't explain it well enough if you have any questions please don't hesitate at any point just to stop me and ask me uh, I'm trying to very succinctly describe something which takes a little bit of time to to get to know and to understand so please don't hesitate at all to ask me any questions uh, moving on uh, another large market um, is for uh, currencies. A lot of people need uh, money in a different currency either to pay their debts or buy some commodities or something else. So there is a quite a large market for uh, currency and this is the FX spot market where uh, two parties exchange sums of money in different currencies. Less for USD, for example. So you uh, pay one million less in order to get 7,500,000 US dollars. 
And the ratio between these two sums of money is the exchange rate on which this is traded. And this is what, um, what is usually quoted and uh, we usually model this again as walk returns. So we are, we are seeing day-to-day -day changes in the, in the FX rate and we take the log of this and subtract one from the other, just as with stocks. Not, not so much, it's not so much, a, it's a large market, but not really in there very much. Now, mm, uh, it's more interesting actually, and FX is uh, quite a large forward market. Uh, I don't need the USD today. I'm quite happy to actually, uh, quite happy with today's exchange rate, but I don't need the money right now. I need them in one month's time when I need to pay for my machinery or whatever. Uh, in order to lock the exchange rate, today's exchange rate in, a, in one month's time, because I don't want to be subject to exchange rate differences and uh, lose money from them, I enter into a forward agreement with another party. Basically, we we agree that we are gonna trade, not today, but in one month's time, and we're gonna trade one million less for 7,500,000 7, US dollars. So we, we fix the date, we fix the FX rate, and we just let it be one month ahead. So this, this would be a forward agreement. And you, you can actually uh, define a forward on all kinds of stuff. Uh, I mean, you can, uh, Give it the FX forward, so we will exchange exchange rates, we we'll exchange currencies, we can exchange stocks, we can exchange on bonds, almost any kind of um, financial instrument can be set up in such a way that we're actually trading in the future. Now, um, the, f the interesting thing about this is that because uh, because we are not doing the exchange today, but rather in the future, uh, we are seeing two cash flows in the future. So one cash flow is what I'm going to give the other party and vice versa. But there's this time difference between today and the actual exchange. And as we mentioned with bonds, uh, future exchanges tend to have a present value. So it's not the same as having done the trade now as doing it one month forward. So uh, we start to see uh, we, we start to see uh, different formulas for the, the forward and for the FX forward here I've given it as an, an example we actually have the following uh, current spot price this is ST and we also have the agreed exchange rate. So today's price is uh, 0 0.75 dollars for, oh, sorry, less for uh, US dollars, but we may agree that it's not gonna be 0 0.75, rather it's gonna be 0 0.73 for some reason. We may believe that this is gonna go somewhere else. We also have the difference in time between today and when actually uh, the exchange would happen. So this would basically be one month in the example given. And we have the exchange rates here. And uh, actually, let me just write it a little bit better. We have, we had this for when we discuss, discussed the bond payments. Here we have something a little bit different actually. Uh, but it's not so much different. It would be something like this. Uh, there. So the, the difference here is the way we quote the return. One would be continuous with the, the exponent and the other one is for a given period strictly speaking for one, only one period. Uh, and the, the actual term is compounding, the way uh, returns are compounded. Uh, 
And the reason being, uh, you all have some dealings with the bank. And uh, when you give them money for deposit, they would quote you, a, let's say, 3% per annum. And if you keep your money for two years, they'll give you 3% for one year, and then they'll, they'll give you 3% more. But because you kept the money in there, you actually, from, uh, if you start with 100 less, at the end of the first year, you have 103 less. So you'll get 3% on top of that, on one old, uh, 103, not on 100. So this is discrete compounding, and it's like this. So you basically start with 100, then you have 100 and 3%, and then this will be square for the end of the second year. Uh, if, if you do something else, if you say, okay, uh, let's, let's not be yearly deposit, but rather be semi-annual deposit. So you keep it again for two years, but now you have four periods. And they will quote something like 2.7%. But you have something like this. 100 at the start of the first year. At the end of the first six months period, you have this amount of money in your bank account because they, uh, they gave you this percentage. At the end of the first year, you actually would have had two payments. So this would be squared. Uh, after 18 months, after 24 months. And if you actually do, to con if you actually continue to decrease the period over which you compound, the second example was six months, let's say do it on a quarterly basis, three months, then a monthly, then two weeks, then one week, and, and you, and you keep keep dividing that period you actually get a limit uh, and in the limit you are actually going to start seeing this here the limits will will tend to the exponent because this is this is basically one plus uh, x over n and this limit tends to So this this is my, a little bit of calculus for you to, to understand actually where where this exponent comes from, and uh, when you end up with continuous compounding, you, it's actually better to use it for a financial instrument like this. So the, the reasoning here is basically just the same. You're seeing two cash flows. The, the nominal, if you multiply the nominal by exchange rate, you're actually seeing uh, amount of money. So that's fine. And these future cash flows are discounted to today. And you subtract one for the other, because you have to pay and you have to receive. And you, you calculate the present value of the two cash flows and get the value of the forward contract. So that's, that's easy. Uh, a closely linked product, which is a futures contract, uh, it's roughly the same idea as a forward. Not roughly, it's actually the same idea. The execution is different. Uh, again, you agree today that you're going to exchange something on a future date. The, the main difference is there are two, actually. One, it's uh, exchange or market facilitated. It's not a contract between two parties. Uh, for a forward, I can meet with whomever I want and we can strike a forward contract. For a future, you actually have a standardized way of do doing things like this and the exchanges usually govern that. So they say, okay, you're gonna have a contract on this commodity or this market index and it's gonna mature on the third Friday of every month going forward 12 months or 24 months. So you have 24 contracts. And you, you cannot actually have uh, a futures contract mature on a another date, which is not governed by the exchange. So that's the first difference. And the other is uh, the fact that actually 
you are not interested in executing the trade as such. Even if it's a for FX future, to, to make the comparison with the FX forward, uh, on the maturity date, you don't really need to exchange the, the, uh, the currencies. What you're looking at is the difference between the date you enter the contract and the date it matured. So um, you have the two cash flows. Do I have this? I have it for equities, but all the same. Uh, so this is just uh, exchanging uh, buying a stock. So it's a stock future. But if you just forget a little bit about this, it's going to be fine. So uh, ST, the current price of the stock. Uh, R, you're moving the current price to the future price. So you're comparing what would be the future. And you're, you're not going to pay this amount when the future matures. Rather, you're going to pay the difference between ST and ST R minus Q T minus T. If you, if you bought the contract at T small T and it matures as ST with price ST, what you're going to pay or what you're going to receive is basically this thing here. So it's, you're trading on, on a margin. And just to mention what Q here is, uh, Q is the dividend rate. So it's uh, the expected rate of return that the stocks would give out. Every company usually uh, distributes its profits uh, from operations to its holders, sh shareholders, in the, th in, in the form of dividends. So every six months they would pay out one and a half dollars for every share you own because you're an owner and want something. And when you translate this one and a half dollars in the dividend rate, you actually have to put it here in, in the futures price. So you subtract it somewhat from the uh, interest rates. Uh, I have another example here and probably one more actually of different kinds of futures because as I mentioned for forwards, I, I mentioned it for forwards but I didn't mention it for futures. Uh, the underlying of the future can be any type of instrument, uh, stock, bond, even interest rate we'll see in a moment. Uh, but there are some differences in the way these things are done on the market, so I wanted to share with you. And for bond future, um, when, when, when you actually want to uh, deliver something, you have to deliver a given bond. But the exchange doesn't really tell you which bond you need to deliver. If you already own a, a bond that follows the guidelines from the exchange, you're fine. You don't need to go out and buy the bond so you can deliver it for the bond future. And the guidance is from the exchange is usually something uh, to the tune of uh, you can deliver any bond that, um, uh, that has at least two years uh, to maturity Changes about the bond future is that the delivered bond should have time to maturity uh, between two and two and a half years and uh, should have let's say six percent semi-annual coupon but uh, the uh, actually the last thing um, uh, the main thing is that uh, there is a pool of bonds which are the so-called cheapest to delivery bond and uh, the guidance as I mentioned the two years and six coupons there uh, when you take into account the different bonds and the conversion ratio do I have it here so I have it in the pricing formula uh, 
the conversion ratio, you actually can, uh, any bond can be delivered as long as the conversion ratio is right and you actually have the bond and uh, when you multiply the bond price by the conversion ratio, you get something which the exchange agrees upon and it's fine by that. So it's a little bit different than just delivering it. And the actual price of a bond future depends on the clean price of the bond, the crude interest, the crude interest best was basically this thing here. So between the start of the the current payment period up to today, and actually we have two accrued interest. One is this one, which is for today, and the other one is this one, which is for the day the bond future will mature. So basically you are looking at something like this. Uh, if this is time, we are today, the bond matures somewhere here. So bond maturity date. The future, however, matures somewhere here. So the future maturity date is here. And if we have a coupon payment here, so we have a cash flow here and a cash flow here, what we take into account is this period, or rather the crude interest from previous payment to today and from the same thing for the future maturity date. And when we when we calculate this, basically this would be uh, the present value of the cash flows during the life of the future. So we're only kind of looking at this coupon payment here. And then we scale it with the conversion ratio. So if, if you built a, uh, a bond that has a conversion ratio of one, you don't, uh, don't actually need to, to solve for this. You actually take the bond price and just jiggle with that a little bit. Another kind of futures, this is interest rate future. And the, the idea here is uh, at the end date of the future, the maturity date, you are actually gonna enter money on a deposit, just like a bank deposit for a three month period, giving a, earning a certain interest. And this interest usually is linked with uh, the London Interbank offer rate, so-called LIBOR. Uh, and um, the current price of such instrument is, uh, is very easy to calculate. You just take uh, 100 minus the LIBOR and this is what the market would quote for an interest rate future. Now, you may ask yourself, I, I'm sure you actually do, why do we need so many different financial instruments? And uh, the reason is hedging. The reason is uh, being able to reduce your risk. We already saw the last lecture that we need to measure it, but we also need to be able to reduce it in some way. And for example, let's say you own a bond. You actually bought a sh uh, an obligation from a given company. And you're worried that, you, uh, that interest rates will go up, your, the bond price will go down, and you're going to lose money. So you need, you need in some way to guard against that. Well, you can always sell the bond, but then you're not going to get anything from that. So uh, that's, that's not really the point. But a way to hedge your risk is actually to enter a, a bond future contract maybe on the, even on the same bond. So you, you lock your current uh, rewards from this bond. And if the bond loses, the bond future will gain. It's a reverse uh, direction. So that's one reason to enter a bond future. And an interest rate future, uh, it's, it's basically a way to, uh, to guard against if you, if you have some forward um, 
or some FX futures, you want to maybe limit your exposure to interest rates in some sense, you, you, you can enter in the interest rate future and lock your holdings uh, and your gains in, in this way. Uh, sorry. How am I doing with time? Only half an hour, in the sense, okay. Uh, so, uh, we are moving a little bit besides futures, and uh, we're going to discuss a little bit about options. Now, uh, an option is a very interesting instrument. Uh, the owner of the option has the right, but not the obligation, to enter into a trade for a given instrument on a future date with a specified price. It's very close to, uh, in some sense, it's very close to the uh, to the future. You have a future trade with a fixed price, with a maturity, but you actually don't have the obligation to enter that trade. For a future, you're fixed. I mean, we are de deciding today that we're going to enter in, into a, uh, trading in one month's time. For an option, it's not the case. I may enter the trade or I may not enter the trade. It's up to my discretion, so it's a right, it's not an obligation. And let, let me just start with giving you an example. Uh, let's say you buy a uh, equity co-option. Co-option is basically uh, the option to buy something on the market and being equity co-option, uh, this is the option to buy, say, IBM shares in one month's time. And you say I'm gonna, I want to buy them for fifty dollars. If the price of IBM in one month's time on the open market, not the option market, on the exchange, is fifty-five dollars, what can you do? You can execute the trade from the option. You are actually doing it. It's your right to do it. Buy the stock for fifty dollars and sell them for fifty-five. So you're automatically gaining five dollars per per share from that. What if the price was forty-five? The option is worthless. I'm not gonna buy the shares for fifty dollars to sell them at forty-five. So I'm not gonna execute. I'm not gonna exercise my option. So this is a very basic example of an option, but it serves the purpose of explaining what an option is basically. So uh, a call option would be uh, to buy the shares, a put option you will actually sh sell the shares. In our example, uh, if the price was 55 on the market, I wouldn't execute the option because I need to, to buy them at 50 and sell them at 55. So I'm going to lose Sorry. Um, buy them at 50. So I'm I'm actually gaining five bucks in, in this case. Uh, sorry, I'm 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 buying the the stocks at 55 on the open market and selling them uh, in the option for 50. So it's not it's not okay. We're still using. Now. Um, Options can be written on, on all kinds of instruments. You can write it on stocks, on bond, on future, on FX. Uh, it, you, can, you can view it as a bet that the market will take a certain direction, either going up or down. And, I think, and options also have exercise type. Because uh, the European type exercise basically states that you can enter the trade only on the maturity date, on the end date of the option. But the American type of exercise, you can actually enter the, op uh, the trade any date between today and the maturity date of the option, inclusive. So you don't have to wait to the end date in order to execute the trade. Now, uh, here I have the so-called Black Shows option pricing formula, uh, which is kind of advanced mathematical concept. 
but uh, it basically gives us the price of a call option on an equity with current price este uh, q being dividend rate t minus t, large t minus small t time to maturity and is the cumulative normal distribution function this uh, uh, an expression like this k is the strike price r is the um, the prevailing interest rates risk-free interest rate and uh, what we have here in d1 and d2 because we have two of those we actually have the ratio between the price the current price and the strike and we also have here the volatility of the instrument so we're actually starting to look at um, at the volatility of the instrument and the reason for that is that oh, do I want uh, well, not really um, the, the whole thing uh, basically is um, it's coming from stochastic differential equations in order to prove this you have to go to stochastic differential equations where you assume a certain model uh, for uh, the changes in stock price I think this was uh, sigma instead the double t but here uh, this is a Gaussian process and when you plug this in a certain uh, stochastic differential equations the solution to those that the differential equations comes out to be this thing so we, I, I don't really want to go in there too much now uh, there's this co-put parity in, in the example I gave you for uh, buying a co and buying a put uh, there's link between the two and the difference between the co and the put is cur the current price minus the strike times well basically the, the strike uh, discounted to today given the interest rates now there, uh, there are a lot of things that go into this formula um, from the market we get ST which is the current price uh, we also get R the, the uh, interest rates and we also have this thing here uh, here standard deviation or variance for the the process of the equity now uh, the, the formula was kind of a revelation when it, it was first introduced so a lot of people began to understand option and uh, became able to price them so they, they weren't trading on their gut feeling but uh, the problem is that the black shows formula doesn't really uh, doesn't really explain everything on the market so uh, the market prices of options uh, do not really follow this model and one of the solutions people uh, found and started using is that um, well let's keep it here uh, is that if you start to change this parameter here you're actually getting values for the options theoretically from this formula that are closer to the market and afterwards market data provider started quoting now what is the implied volatility for options now the, this would mean the, the following they have this formula they have all the other uh, values here figured out and they have the market price which is actually quoted on the market what they need to solve for is this sigma and when you solve for sigma you actually get a value which is implied volatility it's implied from the option market for the equity process which is uh, a separate market, right? I mean, you trade option, uh, trade options on one market, and you trade equity on another market. They're they're interrelated, of course, but they're still separate. Separate people are trading them. 
on the very least. So uh, you have this implied volatility, and when you when you start to uh, take different values for t and different values for k, because options uh, are traded for different t's and for different k's, you actually get a surface out of this. One dimension is the time to maturity, the other dimension is the moneyness, basically the ratio between the current price and the strike of the option. And, and this is quoted, and this is something that uh, people tend to look at. Look at, and let me see if I can actually plot something. It goes something like this, where uh, here. So, uh, like this. So, uh, in this direction, we have the volatility. In this direction, we have time to maturity, or sorry, uh, moneyness. So, uh, ST over K, and in this direction, we have time to maturity. So, higher this. And it turns out that implied volatility is lowest when this ratio is close to 1. So we have the lowest implied volatility there, and as soon as you start to go out of this one, so the, the difference between the option strike price and the current um, market price of the equity becomes either larger than 125 or smaller than 0.75, you start to see increase in the implied volatility. So the option market ex expects larger volatility to go into the formula whenever uh, we have a large, large jumps either uh, positive or negative for the price. So this is what I have this for the implied volatility. Now, uh, going back a little bit to interest rates, uh, we have interest rate swaps. Now, a swap. In, in very general is an exchange of one instrument for another or for money. So we all know English, so a swap is just an, this exchange. Uh, interest rate swap is the exchange of future cash flows. So uh, when I enter a swap contract with another party, um, I will be getting every six months a fixed percentage of the nominal, let's say 6%, and I will be paying a floating percentage, let's say from the prevailing liberal rates. So I'm, I, I have the obligation to pay every six months, but I'm not really certain what I'm gonna pay uh, for, for future dates. And in terms of cash flows, this actually looks very interesting. Where did I? have fixed payments here, let's say, of 6% per annum. So on, on here. And coming out of this, we actually have floating rates. So this would be SD1%, SD2%, or something even smaller, something like this. or something large. So, um, of course, uh, these percentages here, they're not actually fixed to 6%. They can be, uh, they, they, this is part of the contract, actually, saying how much fixed percentage you're gonna you're willing to exchange you know, your future uh, payments to be something like this. And why would you do something? Why would you enter into an interest rate future swap contract? Let's say you have a bond portfolio, and this bond portfolio is, all, uh, is fixed. 
you know that every six months you're gonna get a certain amount of money. But you're not happy with that. You don't want the fixed percentages. You want something either more or something, a little, or you want to gamble a little bit and uh, pay for something more. So you're gonna enter your swaps, and let's say you, your portfolio every six months gives you six percent. So you're giving out these fixed percentages here for whatever you're gonna get from here. So that's that's a reason for entering into an interest rate swap. And the actual, uh, the actual number here the, for the fixed one is what's called the swap rate. And this is the amount you're willing to give up. And do I have a slide for this? Yes. Uh, when all the interest rate swaps are combined from the market uh, and you're actually seeing what the market is willing to trade for this swap rate, uh, you actually get an indication of uh, how, how the market perceives future cash flows to, um, to behave. And you actually can build a swap curve, just as just an uh, interest rate curve, for, uh, built from the swap rates. And uh, this is actually a quite important curve, the swap rate curve, basically because uh, I need to ask you a question. Uh, how would you understand a risk-free rate? What is a risk-free rate? We, we spoke a little bit about risk in the free previous lecture. What, what the risk-free rate would be? Yeah, it's, there's no default, yeah, absolutely. So you don't expect to lose anything from there. And this is the right, you, you want to learn the very bare minimum, so there's no loss. There's no return over there, right? This is, this is the, the rate which gives you no risk and no reward henceforward. So this is the very basic uh, rate you're willing to take in order to, to get time value of money. And uh, usually when people talk about risk-free rate, they usually picture w uh, the way, for example, US government can finance it itself. Because th what, what they do is they issue bonds, they give them to the treasury, the treasury prints money. That, that's the way the US financial system basically works. And these bonds, they, they have certain price, which has certain rate. We already saw how to, how to calculate that rate. So that, that is the rate that it's a free risk free rate because the US government probably will not default. By probably, I mean it's <laughs> it would be very interesting if that happens and no one expects something like this to happen. So that's a very, very, that's the lowest possible rate you can get. But that's the rate the US government can finance itself. If you go out to some other party and ask for a loan or for a certain cash flow, they're never going to quote you the, the rate that the US Treasury gets. You're never going to see that. And in a certain sense, the risk-free rate, the lowest possible rate that uh, market participants are willing to trade on is the swap rate. The LIBOR and the swap rate, of course. LIBOR for less than one, one year, including one year, and the swap rate for onwards. So uh, the, swap, uh, the swap curve basically uh, can be used as uh, risk-free rate for different things. And very quickly, um, credit default swap. Uh, it's a, basically an instrument designed to transfer default risk. So it's, uh, it's a contract between two parties that if a given bond defaults, uh, the protection seller would reimburse the protection buyer. So uh, in, from the point of view of the protection buyer, uh, there are two possible outcomes. Either there is no default, so he would get his money from the bond, or there is default, in which case the money uh, for that he was supposed to get from the bond would come from the protection seller. 
So he doesn't bear any default risk. E even if there is default, he'll still get his money back. So uh, the contract is designed just to transfer this risk, so there is none for the protection buyer. And basically the protection seller uh, needs to be reimbursed because he takes all the default risk f from the from the buyer and for this reason he quotes a CDS spread which would be a, a coupon payment that the buyer needs to pay to the seller every six months or every one year in, in let's say half a percentage point so he'll get half a percentage point every six months just because he has the obligation if the bond defaults to repay the protection buyer the money for the bond so CDS spreads are what is extracted from uh, from the bond, and the the reason this thing here uh, is is in the lectures uh, at all is the following: uh, you, you can actually use it to price a bond if you know what the market is quoting as CDS spreads for the given bond or the given issuer. You can use this information to get the price of the bond and this theoretical price would be closer to the market price than just using a yield curve as we saw before no. I, I, I hope I didn't bore you uh, so far because the, the, that, that was just different instruments a lot of information just uh, piled on to you but uh, the thing that it's important uh, to come out of this and uh, the reason why this information was given out is the following. Uh, any, any financial instrument that can be defined as a mathematical function of basically several variables and we split them in two. On one hand, we have these Fs here from 1 to N, and the other one is Ds from 1 to K. And basically, the Ds are easier to work with. It, the Ds are, they are fixed, they are, uh, are non-random, they don't change at all for a given financial instrument. So this would be the maturity month of, of the bond, the size of the fixed coupon, the periodicity of the coupon, for example, the maturity of uh, the future, the strike price of the option, these things are fixed. They don't change during the life of the contract. So uh, these variables, of course, enter the, uh, the equation, but the more interesting ones are these Fs. And these Fs are the things that change from day to day. For example, we saw in the Black Show, so, uh, option pricing formula, uh, ST, this changes every day. So this is the price, the current price of the equity and this change. So there, there is a random component here the, or what we think is a random component. If we knew everything, maybe it's not random, but uh, a good representation would be a random variable. So, so there is something random which changes during the life, life of the contract. And actually the price of the co-option is this formula here and this would be one F, this would be actually a D, this would be another D, here K is another D, R is another F. So it's something that can change from day to day. If for some reason today's interest rates are twice as high than yesterday's, this could happen, it has in the past so it's possible to happen again the price of the co option would change just based on that so we we're we're about to see a change in the in the form uh, in the price of the instrument based on the change in one of its factors which would be the interest rate so so we have this decomposition of the price of the instrument based on a formula between random components and fixed terms and conditions. And <coughs> imagine this, we, we observe today the factors. These, these are the factors today. 
what would happen if we change these factors to be another realization of the whole vector? This thing here. There are new values. They're, they're not what is currently on the market, but it's something else. We can recalculate the whole thing. This would be some, this would not be the market price at all, but this would be the market price given this realization of the factors. And then this interesting thing happens when you compare this with the actual value. And this would be the loss or gain, depending on the, the sign of this, between what you are currently observing on the market and what we, you would observe is the, if the um, factors change to these values here. So this gives you an idea of how to actually derive losses or gains for your portfolio. You calculate your instruments, you somehow get a new realization of the factors. This thing here. You form these differences and combine everything in a portfolio. And this would give you, of course, the change in portfolio value from today to a realization of these things here. And we already saw in the previous lectures, once we know, we can actually, we, we know how much the portfolio can loses or gains, we can actually uh, quantify the risk that this portfolio has. Either by VAR or ETL or even standard deviation if one likes. And this basically gives us uh, a way to estimate risk. And how, how to get new realizations? That's a separate matter. Uh, the easiest way would actually be to look at what the historical values would, would have been. Today's IBM value is 50, to yesterday it was 49. What would happen if tomorrow it's 49 again? We can actually plug 49 into the formula into, for the various instrument and see what the change for other instrument would be, what the, the call price would be at 49 and today's values. So th that would be the historical approach and it's not very sophisticated, you're just taking what's what was yesterday or what the values were for any given period, let's say last year, you only look in last year and you substitute, you get 250 values, you can estimate risk. A more sophisticated and I would say better approach to model this would be to actually build a probabilistic model for the various factors in there. So you take the log, the log returns of stocks you take the first differences of interest rates, you take the first differences for implied volatilities, for example, you build a model that encompasses all of these factors. Uh, the simplest one would probably be a multivariate normal model where everything is governed by um, the Gaussian distribution. And then you simulate from this. Once you have a probabilistic model, it's usually very simple to simulate from the model. You estimate it on historical data, for example, you take the last year of historical data, fit the parameters of the model, of the probability model, and using those parameters you provide new simulations. And you can actually do this a lot. The usual way would be to have 10,000 simulations for, for future or new realization of the factors, but even a one million is not out of the question. And, and when you have one million, you have later on very stable statistics on the, the losses and the gains of the portfolio. So this, this is probably the, the main slide in this slide deck. Just how the, a general instrument would work, work and was the distinction between factors and financial instruments. Because as we saw, a lot of these are actually not, not prices of instruments. They are information that is extracted from financial instruments but are not actually that observed. You still can find data providers for them, either Bloomberg, Reuters, or any other number of data providers. They, they supply this information. But 
they are not really the prices of financial instruments. They are something else. They are risk factors. So this, this is the distinction between a risk factor and a financial instrument. Okay. Any, any questions, please? Okay. So next week we, we're going to build on this. Uh, we're going to see how, basically, what, what, uh, what are the approaches for modeling uh, the factors? What, what are good approaches for modeling? Why one uh, model in certain ways? How, how to extract information from the time series data through the probabilistic model and onwards to simulations? And we're going to talk a little bit about the system once more, how it all gets together, what, what models are there, are, and so on. So we're going to see how, how the system answers those questions we asked ourselves the first lecture for financial models. Please. Uh, how long was the film analytical working on this problem? Uh, well, uh, the firm was, uh, I think, 200. Uh, 2001, it was funded in 21, so that's like 13 or 14 years. Uh, um, but the actual mathematics and all the rest there go back a little bit more. So our, our chief scientist uh, is a professor of financial mathematics and a well-known professor, Zari Rachev. And he and his daughter basically started the whole thing and got the ball running quite quite some time ago. So yeah, uh, a, lot, a, a lot of time was spent on this, so to speak. It seems complicated. Uh, to a certain extent, yes, it, it, it is. It is, that's why it's interesting, so to speak. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, and see you next week. This program is brought to you by AUBG Talks. For more, please visit us at aubg.edu talks.